ever had an awesome idea for a new machine learning project and you had yourself wondering about how to select the right model for your task at hand? Well, look no further. In this video, I'll show you three simple steps about how to select the right model for your task. And also in the end, I will share some more tips and tricks about how to select the correct size of hidden layers and neurons for your own neural network if you choose to roll your own solution. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Johannes Frey, or just simply call me Joe, and I've been working as a software engineer for more than 10 years now. I am self-employed, I run my own company, which does data science and DevOps work, because at some point in time, you also want to deploy your awesome machine learning models to production. And by the way, the next video will be about image segmentation using deep neural networks. So if you're interested in that one, please consider subscribing to this channel and hitting the notification bell icon so that you get informed as soon as the video is out. So, but now let's dive in. So the first thing is you should think about the problem that you have and break it further down. Okay, so are you trying to work or process images? Are you working with text or is it time series data that you're looking for? Because each of those areas have their own architectures for neural networks to work with. So for example, usually when dealing with images, you will pick convolutional neural networks. With text processing, there is usually recurrent neural networks or also the convolutionals. And for time series data, it's kind of like the same as for text data because text can also be seen as some timeline of words one after each other. So also for time series data, usually recurrent neural networks or convolutional neural networks are used. So with that in mind, now you at least have some idea about what architecture in general to pick and to watch out for. So the next point would be to break that even further down. So you need to try to translate the task at hand into machine learning language, right? So because whether, for, for example, let's pick image processing. If you want to decide whether something is pictured on an image, that one is called in machine learning language a classification task. If you want to find the location of something in an image, that one is called object detection. So I really want to make sure that you have the correct terms there so that when doing some online research, you know exactly what to look for. So now that we have put some more generic frame around the problem that you're trying to solve, so let's stick for this example with image processing. Okay, now we know, okay, all right, we want to do image processing and we want to know whether something is on a picture. So, okay, we know it is image processing. So probably the architecture will be something with, with a convolutional neural network. And also we know that the task of deciding whether something is on an image or not is called a classification task. So now we know, okay, we are searching for some convolutional neural network that is able to classify images. Let's go from here to the second step. The second thing you really want to think about while selecting the right model for your use case is the amount of available data that you have. And yeah, so data is king, right? As data scientists, we are trying to understand the data and we try to train our models on data. But data isn't like all we need. What we actually need is labeled data. And labeled is the keyword here because only with labeled data, we can make some qualified decisions. I mean, sure, there are also algorithms that deal with unlabeled data that's called unsupervised learning. But for now, we will be dealing with labeled data, so with supervised learning. So, and yeah, it really depends on how much data you have available. Okay, let me rephrase it. How much labeled data you have available, because that one is crucial. So what actually is labeled data? So labeled data is data that has been annotated by some human. So some person looked at images and said, okay, that object is on that image and that object is missing in that one. So basically we have the image and also some label to it, which says, okay, this image contains a dog and that image contains a cat, right? So you really need this labeled data and the amount of it also highly impacts the 
model selection. So for example, if you have lots of label data, then you're, ooh, then you're just a lucky boy or also yeah, maybe a lucky girl if you happen to be a girl, right? So if you have a lots of label data, you have the most freedom in selecting the model to use because now you're not only restricted on pre-trained models, but if you find some model that exactly fits your case, you're also able to train the model from scratch. So if you don't have that much data, you can still make it work. There are things called pre-trained models and you will have to look out for those then because with pre-trained models, you can just take them and adapt them to your use case with some little effort. What pre-trained models actually are, I will tell you in about a second, but for now just be with me and we will come to the explanation. And even if you have lots of data available, pre-trained models are also a very strong consideration here, but here you just have the freedom that you don't have to use them. So if you find a model that fits perfectly, but it isn't pre-trained, then you can just, just train it from scratch. The third thing you should think about when selecting the right model for your task is the actual application of the model, which means how are you going to use the model? Because usually with deep learning models or machine learning, there is a accuracy and speed trade-off. State-of-the-art deep learning models tend to get quite complex and big. And this also has an effect on their runtime behavior. Because usually the bigger the model gets, the slower it will be. But also it will be a lot more capable. So you really need to think for yourself, do you really need a huge model with the last percentages of accuracy or maybe a model with a bit less of accuracy but a much faster runtime is the correct thing for you. Also there are sometimes smaller versions of the big models that are designed especially for use cases with limited resources like cell phones or embedded systems. For example, there is the mobile net neural network developed by Google, which is ex explicitly designed for mobile applications like uh, smartphones and so on. So it basically it boils down to the Pareto's law or also called the 80-20 rule. So usually with like 20% of the input, so with the 20% of the effort you put in, that you put into the complexity of your model, you already get 80% of the prediction results. But then to get the very last 20% out of it, at the end you will fight for every percentage point and every percentage point will make your model exponentially more complex and big. So you just need to, to, to kind of like wait whether the uh, very last percentage of accuracy is important to you or whether a faster uh, performance during runtime is more important to you. So now that we have all the requirements and also limitations clear, we can do some online research, also known as Googling stuff, to um, find the right model for your task at hand. But while doing so, also keep in mind that Deep learning models usually shine with very complex um, tasks like image processing, text processing, or time series analysis. And there are lots of battle-proven models around from research groups that are already pre-trained. Now let's talk about what a pre-trained model actually is. So a pre-trained model is usually a model that is published by the group of developers that, is, that came up with the idea of the model and um, they trained it on a huge massive data set and put the trained model online so that you can just use their trained model. So to put this in, or just to give an example, most of the image processing models from the research groups are trained on ImageNet. And ImageNet is a data set consisting of 14 million images that are all labeled and classified so that um, that is valid usable training data. And yeah, I mean, usually normal people like you and I are not able to get like that huge amount of, uh, of, of data. And also, uh, yeah, it would just take forever to train a model from scratch on that much data. 
So usually you will then get this pre-trained models also still in the area of image processing we're talking. So you will get this pre-trained model from this research group that is trained on the ImageNet data set and then you will cut the lower layers of the neural network away from it and replace it with some new layers by yourself. And then you will partially train the model on the smaller amount of data or like of all the data you have available. If you have like a lot of data, you can use lots. If you just have a little bit, you can just use what you have. And to adapt the network to your needs and usually that one will perform quite well. Also, if maybe the task that you're trying to solve isn't like that complex like image processing, maybe you just have some tabular data with, I don't know, maybe some hundred thousand lines of entries, then also, yeah, it is worth to, to think about maybe not using deep learning at all. Maybe just stick with some of the classic algorithms for machine learning, like yeah, maybe a random forest and give it a shot because usually with a smaller amount of data and with some optimization, those, te those techniques and algorithms even outperform deep learning approaches. Because what you need to think about is that most of this state-of-the-art neural networks that you find online are quite complex and super big. So you probably will have a hard time understanding what's actually going on in them. And usually I'm always recommending you should really know what the neural network is actually doing. So what the model is doing to really know how to tweak stuff and also to know if things go wrong, how to adjust them. And with that being said, sometimes you also just want to get something out. So then you have basically two, two approaches that can, you, can, you can use. You can take one of those state-of-the-art complex models, try to find one that has some training scripts that make it easier for you to train it and just put it out there and hope for the best. Sometimes it will even work out and you will get decent results with it. But also another thing that you could, could consider is there are also yeah, smaller models that you can use and also that you can understand. And so if something goes wrong, then you can make a more opinionated decision about what's, go uh, what's going on and what to do. And yeah, then you won't just be blindly switching parameters and hoping for the best to happen, but because then you will know what's going on and what to tweak and what to expect out of your tweaks. So always decide whether picking the state-of-the-art models and not really understanding what's going on or putting a lot of time and effort into really understanding what's going on or just maybe get some percentages of accuracy off and get some simpler model but really understand what's going on and then you can in the long run I think even benefit more from that. So again it kind of depends and you need to make the call which way to choose. With that being said, if you don't want to use one of those neural networks from the research groups and you want to uh, go with your own implementation or just want, so want to implement it by yourself, there are also some things to consider. So the first thing that you want to consider in this case is maybe you still should go with some of the uh, neural networks from the research groups because they're usually better proven and yeah, are known to perform quite well. And some fun fact around is um, around that is that yeah some of the w very latest state of the art uh, deep learning models aren't even engineered by humans anymore because the people developed deep neural networks that actually come up with new deep uh, neural networks. So basically, there is like machine learning that produces machine learning models because they come up with stuff that not even the uh, researchers can think about. And yeah, so some of the current state of the art models aren't even engineered by humans anymore. So just keep that in mind. And, but still, if you have like super simple data, as I said, some tabular data and you just want to roll your own neural network or maybe for practice reasons, or also you can just roll your own solution and just use it as a baseline model to compare all the other uh, neural networks that you try with that one so that you know how they perform compared to your own solution. So in this case, I want to share some tips and tricks about how to pick the size of the hidden layers and also how many neurons you should put into them. So for the hidden layers, usually 
you want to start with one hidden layer because that is yeah in most cases actually enough if you have like a super complex uh, problem and the data is hardly separable then maybe go for two but two should in most cases be enough there are not that many cases where you actually need to go beyond that point but yeah as i said for this very complex task and if you want to get the very last percentage of accuracy the state of the art deep learning models are over 50 layers deep even so but we are talking about a simpler solution right now so usually start with one hidden layer if that one isn't good enough put another one in there but usually one or two should be enough so for the neuron count you should have a look at the relationship between the input and the output of your neural network if this relationship isn't that complex then usually starting with two-thirds of the input plus the output should be enough and if the relationship between the input and output is more complex then usually less than twice the size of the input neurons should be enough those numbers are from a researcher called Jeff Heaton and those numbers have served me quite well so far so it, they are a good starting point to elaborate on so but they give you some rough frame how much to choose so that you don't need to choose thousands of neurons uh, right away and you have a more controlled boundary in which you want to choose the neuron size all right that's it for this video so as i said already the next video will be about image segmentation so if you're interested in that one consider subscribing this channel and hitting the notification bell icon below thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video